Well, hello, everybody. I'm Royal oh, Eagle. Hey, it's me. Yeah, it's you. Okay. <laughs> I'm Royal Eagle, and it's Shaggy hey! right here. <laughs> oh, oh Conquest with the subs! Thank you for the four months! <laughs> so, speaking of kinky. Who the hell said anything about kinky? You really should look at your chat. <laughs> oh, do I really have. Oh, it does say kinky. <laughs> ah, alright, guys, so welcome to the True Crime Theater. We are, uh,. Gonna be talking about a serial killer today. Uh, <laughs> just heard Keith. <laughs> Tied us. Shh. <laughs> Love you. Um. So, Shaggy, you ever heard of uh, Lizzie Holiday? No. No. What is a Lizzie Holiday? Lizzie Holiday was the very first uh, female serial killer in New York. And the very first woman to be sentenced to death by an electric chair. What era? 1890s. So wait, like, who was weapon of choice? <laughs> I guess we'll find that out. Oh. Uh... Alright guys, so we're gonna get into it. We are gonna switch to sub mode right now, so we can concentrate on this. You got that or do you need to do it? It is done. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, we're going to take you back in time a little bit, guys. The Catskills were a peaceful place in the 1890s, until one woman disrupted the peace by hiding bodies on her farm. The notorious Lizzie Halliday, one of America's most deranged early serial killers. Now, think about the time frame, okay? Wrigley's company was founded in Chicago this time. Uh, Britain was just linked to North America for the first time by phone. Carnegie Hall opens up in New York, and Thomas Edison patents the motion picture camera. Electricity was finding its foothold, having just been invented 12 years prior. And Nebraska introduces the eight-hour workday, which I personally resent. So if you hate work from 40 hours, we gotta deploy to Nebraska for that one. Fuck Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, fuck Nebraska. <laughs> But to go back a little further than the 90s, so our story actually starts um, in 1859 uh, in Antrim, Ireland. The Elizabeth Margaret McNally was born. Now, I've seen a couple of sources where they say she was either three, five, or eight when she immigrated over here to America with her parents and nine siblings across the net. Uh, the Atlantic. Um, they settled. Oh, I see. Why are you, why are you freaking me out? I got scared. <laughs> I'm like, we haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> All right. Um, me, you just shouted yourself out. And I got dead by Dale. I did not. Oh, no, Tater did it. <laughs> hey, Tater. Trying to be a good noodle. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um they settled in New York City, which was back then the melting pot, you know, in the you've heard it the history books, it was called the melting pot. So a lot of uh immigrant families settled in New York City and uh Lizzie was very much feared uh by everybody in the on the streets. They were her violent temper was well known, and she had an ugly characteristic, which would result in her estrangement from her own family. Now, describe violent temper. Like she would. They don't have any specific examples, but it, as you hear the story, you'll kind of get it in your head that she was just not all the way there. <laughs> so, um. Lizzie left home when she was still a teenager after numerous physical altercations with her family members. She went rambling around the eastern states until 1879 when she married Charles Hopkins in Pennsylvania. The couple had one son, uh, but by 1881, Hopkins had died suddenly and Lizzie was a widow. 
Now, there isn't a lot of information or some. I couldn't even find his name, and I checked everywhere. Like, everywhere. So, <laughs> um, what are the odds that the son was fake? Um, he wasn't fake because he was institutionalized. But it, it was said that his rage surpassed even his mother's rage. He was institutionalized at a young age, and he just kind of disappears. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so yes, Charles Hopkins died mysteriously, and soon after, like so soon after their marriage, like they weren't even married a whole two years. So, let's see. Um, but she didn't stay a widow for long. She actually mar went on to marry an elderly gentleman by the name of Artemis Brewer. Just months after the wedding, though, he died. They didn't have a cause of death for either him or Hopkins, but they, like, she wasn't married to long to either one. Um, Lizzie, Lizzie quickly moved on to her third husband, who came in the form of Hiram Parkinson. How old is she at this time? Uh, this was all within the same, like, couple of years, so... Man, that's nuts. She, she would have been in her, like, 20s. Or, like, yeah. Alright. Um... So, she marries Hiram, and in just weeks into the marriage, he vanished without a trace. They could never find him. Just vanished. Yeah, just vanished. What do you use there? Like, day? they could not oh. find him, and she just, she claimed abandonment. Okay. Now she's starting to look a little <laughs> sus, red sus. Right, right. So she's on husband number three, man. <laughs> So, now she goes on husband number four, where, um, where she met Civil War veteran George Smith. Months into the marriage, she spiked his tea with arsenic. Now, Smith survived, um, but before he could bring her to justice, she already fled with all of his money. Now, you say fled with like, all his money. What, what what kind of amount are we talking here, Chief? It didn't give me an amount. You gotta realize this is the 1800s and records are spotty. They don't have these records, like, computerized. And then here, we could put together some effort. <laughs> okay. Was she, was she able to get, like, let's say, vehicle to house? Um, sort of, actually. She did come back, like, she resurfaced in 1888 in Philadelphia and ended up buying a, her own shop. It doesn't say what kind of shop, it just says a shop. But, uh... Yeah, hold on, she's a female owning a shop in the early 19th century. That, I mean, she... takes money. Yeah, I know. And she was staying with the McKillens family. Now, the McKillens were neighbors of hers back in Ireland. And they graciously let her stay with them. Um, the McKillens actually owned a saloon, and Lizzie actually changed her name to Maggie Hopkins. Maggie for her middle name, Margaret, and, you know, her husband's first, her first husband's last name was Hopkins. So, with the money she stole from previous husbands, she set up a shop, which later burned down in an insurance scam. Lizzie had a thing for fire. <laughs> Keep this in mind. <laughs> so she is pulling insurance scams before it was gangsta. Oh yeah. <laughs> on right. on St. Patrick's Day in 1888, McNally was convicted of arson and sent to the Eastern State Penitentiary for a two-year stretch. Now, to kind of go off, the Eastern State Penit uh, Penitentiary is still standing today. It's in Philadelphia, and um, it was operational from 1829 to 1971. They wanted to make it a ref um, reform place instead of a punishment place. So people like Al Capone went there, and uh, James Bruno and several of his male relatives were there, and uh, Willie Sutton was there as well. All notorious crime people. 
Like they, but they were more like gangsters, you know. Say, like I hear reform, I hear like being pampered the whole time they're there. Like, yeah. oh man, you shot the mailman twelve times. Here's a steak. We got your massage scheduled later, and we even got you a little guy in the shower. Go ahead and break him in. <laughs> but yeah, they uh, so like major criminal bosses actually went to it was like a federal prison, and um, to this day it is still standing. It is the largest structure ever built back then. And it's open to the public now for tours. It's a national, it's a U.S. historic land, landmark. See, I see. Yeah. Uh, anyways, so when Lizzie was released, she changed her name to Lizzie Brown and found employment as a housekeeper for an elderly widower named Paul Halliday, who resided on a farm in Sullivan County in upstate New York. In 1890, she married him and became known as Lizzie Halliday, the name for which she would go down in the annals of uh, criminal history. <laughs> so, uh, Hall uh, Paul Halliday popped the question soon after because a neighbor has said he thought it would be cheaper to marry Lizzie than to pay her wages. Doing what to pay her wages? He said it would be cheaper to marry her than to pay her for being a maid. Yeah. Oh. Weird flex, but we'll allow it, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul Halliday had two sons, Robert and John. Robert was the oldest, and John, being younger, he was um, a little more fragile, and he was also said to be mentally handicapped. Uh, Lizzie did not like this, like, did not like John, did not want anything to do with John, resented the fact that he had to take care of, she had to take care of John. So, they were very openly hostile to each other, and Robert, being very protective of John, did not like Lizzie either. So, on May 2nd in 1891, Paul Halliday uh, set off in his horse-drawn carriage from his home in Birmingham, New York, to do a job 10 miles away, and he left his new wife, Lizzie, who was about 40 at this time, and, uh... Oh, sorry. It says 40 years his junior. So she was she was 40 years younger than him. Really? Yeah. Um, and her... And his son, John, who was 37 at the time. Um, while he was away, on May 6th, she burned down a portion of the family home. And on May 26, she burned down one of the large barns on the farm and drove all of her husband's workhorses to the town of Newburgh, where she sold them. <clears throat> now, he came home and he confronted her, and she lashed out at the two holiday uh, sons and threatened Paul with death. And on several occasions after that. So... In 19, oh, sorry, 1893, I can't read numbers, my bad. <laughs> okay, I don't math well. Yeah. <laughs> In 1893, McNally actually burned down her husband's mill while his son John was inside it. Uh, because John of John's disability, he died of the fire. So Lizzie told him that they were inside when the fire started. She got out. John did. But she just let this man's son die? Yeah. About a month later, there was a different angle to the story. The paper reported Lizzie had been arrested and was suspected of locking John in a room and setting the fire intentionally to kill him. Damn. She fucking murdered him. <laughs> and he was disabled? Yeah, he is mentally handicapped. That's a big size. So, uh, she was deemed insane and sent to an asylum, but she wasn't there long when the authorities claimed that she was cured and they released her. <laughs> to Paul Halliday, who took her back. 
And when the reporters asked him why they took her, why he took her back, he said, "No fool like an old fool." <laughs> so yeah, I don't get it, but you know, love makes you do uncomfortable shit. I don't know. <laughs> love makes you set your son's mentally handicap or your husband's son I mean, mentally handicap on fire. I mean, he could have been a he could have been scared of her and took her back for fear of his life. That makes a lot more sense. That makes too much sense. Because, like, I mean, if your crazy wife is in the asylum after killing your son, and she's like, "You let me come home, or else," wouldn't you be like, "Um." Yeah, I, I know what they're that not girl keeping is. her, <laughs> but she's she's okay. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> so uh, after the fires, the old man did talk freely about his belief that his wife was responsible for the blazes and his son's death. So she was just like he was just like spouting off to anybody who would hear that his wife is nuts. <laughs> Which probably ended in why he, you know. <laughs> well, boy, it's nuttier than peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so four months later, Paul disappeared. And Robert, who never liked the new wife, suspected foul play. He asked Lizzie where his father was, and she's like, oh, he's away on business. Robert didn't buy it, and he obtained a search warrant because Robert actually was in law enforcement at the time. He was training to become a sheriff. Oof. Yeah. So he he gets a warrant to search the house, and a group of Holiday's friends and family found bloodstains and a spent revolver cartridge inside the house. And she insisted he was alive. She said she'd prove it by taking a couple of the searchers to him. But as soon as the carriage left with the searchers, the other people that stayed decided, like, we're not gonna believe you. We're gonna keep looking around. <laughs> and as they looked around, they found not one, but two female corpses in the barn. Hidden in hay. Female. Female. Yeah. Remember the McKillums? Yeah. Yeah. The wife and daughter, Margaret and Sarah, uh, disappeared after accepting a house cleaning job from Lizzie. And that's what they found in the bar. So they, or she <laughs> murdered the poor girls? Yeah. These are the same people who helped her when she needed a place to stay. And that whole insurance uh, scam burning down her shop, she also burned down their saloon. This woman was on a fire roll. Oh, she was arson to the fullest. Days later, there was a stench coming from the floorboards of the Holiday House, and it drew attention of the police. Paul Holiday's body was discovered under the floorboards in the kitchen. That's very swag money of her. <laughs> so all three victims were shot several times in the heart, and Halliday's body was mutilated. Mutilated how? Um, so you ever heard of the Whitechapel murders? You know uh, of Jack the Ripper? Yes. Those are the Whitechapel. And if you've ever heard of the work Jack the Ripper did, used to tear like his victims to shreds yes very hot very erotic yeah it was very much similar to how she mutilated paul so erotically yeah okay so she's got a style uh according to conquest she's very swag money very I swag money of her good. yeah <laughs> She's a pretty lit individual. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so now I would assume everyone is on to her. Oh, uh, so yeah, when she came back with the uh, other investigators, uh, they questioned her about it, and she started speaking in like gibberish and tearing her clothes off. 
Now, a lot of people considered it an act of fake insanity, while others were like, without a doubt, she was just off. She was just mental. Attack. This bitch is us. <laughs> and we're not even done yet. Because she's not done yet. <laughs> Thank so, you for the little conquest. It's almost the 1900s, and there isn't a happy-go-lucky you know, borderline psychotic sheriff around that's ready to, like, put six full rounds into her chest and just call it a night. So that's the problem. <laughs> because she's a woman, they tr they treated her different than the men. Ah. Uh... Yes. So if it was a male doing all this, he would have been like, you're going to jail, fuck you, we're not even doing this. But because it was a woman, they wanted to believe that she was just not mentally there. That a woman wasn't capable of doing this kind of murder. So, during her pre-trial st uh, stint in jail, the sheriff came by with his wife to see if they can just talk to her, and she attacks the, wife, the sheriff's wife. No, she, uh, she tried to strangle her. She didn't succeed. No, no. Then they they were able to release her grip off the wife and they left right away and come back. Wicked. Hey Lolo! Thank you for the three months. I so appreciate you. Hey, what's going on, Lolo? We're doing some true crime theater today. <laughs> so let's see. Where did we leave? Oh yes, yeah, so, so she attracted the sheriff's wife. They got her freed. And uh, they decided to leave her alone while we wait for the trial. Now, Lizzie's trial for the murder of Sarah McKillen started out on June 18th, 1894, and ended with a verdict of guilty and a sentence of death. She is the first woman in the world to be condemned to the electric chair. But here's the problem. So... A couple of things happened at the trial. One, on the way out of the courtroom, she bit the sheriff's hand. The sheriff's hand and arm later got so infected that he lost it to amputation. Yeah. So even under control of the law, Lizzie was still causing mayhem and destruction. And because she was a woman, the New York Governor Roswell Flower decided to commute her sentence to life in a mental institution instead. So she was sentenced to death, and she was not dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so McNally was sent to the Madawan State Hospital for the crim Criminally Insane, where she remained for the rest of her life. But wait, we're not done yet. <laughs> so Lizzie wasn't the best of prisoners. She was, you know how they let you out if you're good behavior? She didn't make that shit. So she managed to start a fire in her prison cell. Nice, nice, as you do. Um, and then she tried to hang herself in her cell, but was caught before she could actually you're dead. Lucky. Yeah. The last and final straw. Now, think of it this, okay? This sheriff has had to deal with her since the trial where he, she strangled his wife, got his arm removed, set fire to her cell, and also tried to hang herself. His last straw was she broke a window in her cell and tried to use the glass to cut her own throat. What was the battle plan? She wanted to see if she could bleed. That's what she told them. No, I meant like, what's the sheriff's battle plan? Oh, what did he do? He chained her to the floor of the cell. Seems a little inhumane. Oh, well, I mean, she was a little inhumane. <laughs> well, I mean, they could have just killed her. That was supposed to be the plan, but the governor's like, nah, she's just insane. Oh no, she got a hold of no, my jar. Don't fuck. put it in your mouth. Don't empty the whole magazine. My oh, bad. Oh no. Why do all my friends die? <laughs> now, 
No, not Lizzie Borden, Lola. We're doing Lizzie Halliday. A little more deranged, actually. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the glass incident was the last straw. So the sheriff's like, you know what? Chain her up. We're not allowed to kill her, just chain her up. <laughs> We're not allowed to kill her. <laughs> um while she was in there, there was a reporter named Nellie Bly who visited Lizzie uh, twice. Now, the Black Widow, she did confess to many other killings, telling journalists it's a long story and it's over many murders besides those already known. But they don't have anything else on the story. She doesn't. The only thing that I could find that remotely. Um, <sighs> Kind of like confirms that she's killed besides the ones we already know about was there was a rumor from paul's son robert that she came to him before he died and said that she was actually married in ireland at one point and that she had killed him but there's no name i couldn't find anything on it that's the only reference i hear on so could have happened, but it was a hundred years ago, so we probably won't even know. <clears throat> so, it was during Holiday's time in jail that authorities began to wonder if she had an even longer track record of crime. So they started looking into the 1888 serial killer and known as Jack the Ripper. They tried so hard to prove that she was Jack the, the Ripper. But with her stay in Ireland at that time, it doesn't match up. So the theory was disproven. <sighs> Maybe I'll do something on Jack the Ripper down the line, but um, one day. But uh, yeah, the the press got a hold of the story though and dubbed her the Catskill Ripper. So. In 1897, she had she and another inmate attacked an attendant, stuffing a towel towel in their victim's mouth, and then stomping, scratching, and beating her. Luckily, the woman survived. Now, right after this, there was a period of calm, partly because of an employee named Nellie Wicks. She was 24, and she took pity on Lizzie, and gave her extra attention. And now the hospital superintendent, Dr. R.B. Lamb, observed that her mania for violence may have been conquered. Until, until Nellie came up to her in 1906 and said that she was no longer going to be at the asylum because she was quitting to go back to school. Lizzie didn't like that, kind of lost her shit, and when Nellie's back was turned, Lizzie jumped her with a pair of stolen scissors and stabbed her 200 times. Holy shit. Yeah. Dr. Lamb was called to the bloody scene. As he entered the room, she looks at him and she says, she won't leave me now. Oof. <laughs> Big fucking oof. And then she starts laughing maniacally. I would assume she was restrained at that point. Possibly. So Lizzie, oh. Lizzie remained institutionalized until her death in, uh, at 58 in 1918. In an obituary, the New York Times called her the worst woman on earth. <laughs> yeah. New York Times coming out strong. So to recap, she has been married six times. Two husbands died suddenly. Two husbands disappeared. One almost poisoned, and one was shot dead. She had killed her stepson in a fire. She uh, shot two fellow immigrants and stabbed a nurse to death. So what I'm hearing is... EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, she is now buried in an unmarked grave on the grounds of the Model 1 State Hospital. An unmarked grave. Uh -huh. Good. I still think that's too good for her. 
So, what are your thoughts? I mean, for a killer that's like early 1900s and one to be compared to Jack the Ripper and almost blamed for his murders. Yeah. She's got an intense rap sheet. That last one got me, though. The, the, the 200 <laughs> times. I'm just like, she ain't even done yet. <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, you know what I mean? Like, 100 stabs and she's like, no, not enough. I just kept going. Like that energy drugs, everybody just keep going. <laughs> That's crazy shit, though. And the fact that she's a woman, like, and then everybody treats women differently. I get that. Oh, well, even, I mean, even now they do. <laughs> no, let a woman go and pull that shit now. But I was on She'll my period. <laughs> She'll get a death sentence. Hell, what, what state's talking about bringing back the fucking firing squad? I don't know. I did hear about that, but yeah. I don't remember which one it was. That's what I mean. Like, imagine I wouldn't be surprised if it was state. Texas. It might have been oh, Texas. <laughs> Aliens coming back in 2025. And like, they were almost there when we left. They were, oh god, they brought back the firing squads. <laughs> oh, no. How did we regress? <laughs> Who's in charge here? Oh. That's <laughs> me. Oh, that explains so much. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the story of Lizzie Halliday. The the reading it was so interesting. <laughs> I will have to say, it's kind of cool knowing about the first. She's the first, right? The very the first ser serial killer, um, and the very first person to, the very first woman to be ever uh, sentenced to electric chair. But she didn't even. But she didn't even get it. That's like the fucked up shit. Like, how you gonna hype it up and she didn't even get the chair? <laughs> I forgot I was a bad bitch Tragic, breaking all the rules